So we've been talking about life from the first, and today we're talking about the first day. Not the first day of creation, and, and not the first customs of a family that we've talked about that shaped life. And not the first day of the beginning of Christianity that we spoke about yesterday at the day of Pentecost. But instead, the first day that Paul makes reference to in his letters to the church in the Roman city of Philippi. And the church of Philippi had an extraordinary relationship with Paul because of him being part of the founding of the congregation. But today, our focus is going to be in the lesson about this relationship that sparked at the beginning because he converted them, he showed them the gospel, but he did more than that. And I want you to see that with me tonight. In your Bible, you'll see the first passage we'll look at in Philippians chapter 1, in verses 3 to verse 6. Tonight, I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. Paul says, I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you, always praying with joy for all of you in my every prayer because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Now notice if you'll skip over to chapter 4, he makes an allusion very much similar to this. And he'll say in chapter 4, in verse 15, You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even in Thessalonica you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek the profit which increases to your account. So notice the book ended in the letter is this emphasis on the relationship that Paul knew that he had had with them from the first day. He thanked God for them because they had had a partnership or fellowship with him in the gospel from the first day. And then here again in chapter 4, he reminds them about the truth that from the first day of the first preaching of the gospel when he was with them, that the church of Philippi had must have, had must have been intentional in supporting Paul in the work that he did as an apostle who evangelized. Now, none of us here are apostles. We actually talked about that yesterday. But the pattern of that relationship Paul set into motion to, re, to describe for churches how they can accelerate the growth of the gospel in wherever they are by supporting men who evangelize and do the work of an evangelist. But when he talks about this first time, the New Testament actually outlines the story. So turn in your New Testament in Acts chapter 16 and see how this relationship with him was started. In verse 6 of Acts 16, Luke says that they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and pleading with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, we immediately sought to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And from there we went to Philippi which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony, and we were spending some days in the city. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were thinking that there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. So notice the beginning of Paul's relationship with the church at Philippi begins when there is no church and begins because when he is there, he goes to a place to find someone praying. Notice the location is that it's a riverside. And notice also that it is not a synagogue. And notice also that it is not inside the city. That tells you what the Philippians, as a culture, 
thought of people who worshipped one God. It may have been true that there weren't enough, enough Jewish men to start a synagogue, but the very fact that these people who are worshipping God, praying at the riverside, and it's mostly women in, indicated by this text, they're outside the city because there was not much interest in the religion of one God. And so from these women, he speaks to the women who have assembled, and the text goes on to say, a woman named Lydia was listening. She was a seller of purple fabrics from the city of Thyatira and a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul, and when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. So the first convert is this woman, given by name. We see her name. She is a seller of purple, but she is not a native resident in the city of Thyatira. And she listens to the message that Paul preaches. In the process, the Lord opens her heart. She believes, and she encourages. Notice immediately the desire for Paul to be with the group that was assembled there in her home so that more could be learned. But then the Apostle Paul works a miracle, heals a girl who's enslaved by a possession of a demon, and the people who owned her made profit from her, became angry at Paul because of it, and ended up having him thrown in prison. He prayed. So the jailer who was present, he had been placed inside the inner prison. There was an earthquake, and the jailer asked for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he had brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the God to him, together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. Now, I think all of the reading that we've just shared is probably familiar territory. And I don't want you to think that this lesson is going to be about what it was Paul taught these people to do to be saved. But if you haven't heard that, I want you to listen to what Paul told them. He preached to them about who Jesus Christ was. He told the man, you need to believe in this Christ. But in both cases, both of them are instructed that they needed to be baptized. And immediately that same very hour of the night, that's what the jailer did with his household. But tonight, if that's true of you, don't leave and let us help you. But I want you to see that the church begins with these two families. It is a possibility that the girl who had been healed by Paul may have become a disciple, but there is no evidence of it anywhere in Scripture. So we can just presume that the early church begins with two families. One family who didn't really live in Philippi, and another family who was not native to Philippi because he was a Roman jailer who probably had been assigned there by Rome. The early church starts with a bunch of foreigners and not Philippians. But from the first day, these people who are foreigners become the church at Philippi. And Luke tells us all about this beginning in one verse. Paul and Silas do not immediately leave Philippi. Now, you may remember the story that Paul reminds his jailer that he's a citizen and that he has been imprisoned and enchained without due process. And because of that, they were going to be in big, 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 big trouble. And so they want him to leave town right away, but he doesn't. Notice the next text we look at in Acts chapter 16, 
verse 40. And leaving the jail, Paul and Silas came to Lydia's house, where they saw and encouraged the brothers and sisters and departed. Now, the first time I read that, I never even thought for a moment why I needed to think about what transpired in the hour. Remember, she wanted Paul and Silas to stay with her. So when they returned to the house, I'm sure they were returning to the place where she had already set up for them to stay. And that they departed doesn't necessarily mean that they departed the next morning. The text doesn't say that. But what the text does say is that when they go to her house, they see the church. And they encourage them. Now that's a funny word, encourage. I loved the way D. Bowman could add color to words. And I remember distinctly him talking about how encouragement gives people courage. And he would use that very visual picture. And that is, of course, the way the word speaks to us in our English, that you empower people with courage. But the significance of the word, at least in the Greek, is not that limited. In fact, the word doesn't really mean that someone walks up to you and says, good job today. Now, in English, that's encouraging. If someone needs to be encouraged, you're going to walk up and you're going to hug them. You might walk up to them and you might, I'm praying for you. There are all sorts of ways that we can encourage people, but the significance of the word that is used here is not just, good job, guy. Because Paul did not walk into Lydia's house with Silas and say, good job, guys. What did he do? Look at other passages that use the same word. In Acts chapter 15, in verse 32, the Bible says, Judas and Silas also, being prophets themselves, encouraged and strengthened the brothers and sisters with a lengthy message. So how many times did they say, good job, good job, good job, good job, good job, good job, good job. It wasn't a lengthy message of good job, was it? And in fact, it tells us that Judas and Silas encouraged them and strengthened them because they were prophets themselves that they were divinely inspired with the ability to speak the will that God had for Christians in the time. So encouragement, even in this verse, means more than, good job, guys. What does it mean? Acts chapter 14, verse 21 and 23. So Paul and Barnabas returned to the churches that they have started. And it says, and they were strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, it is through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, they went on their way. So now when we're told that Paul and Barnabas return to the churches and they are encouraging them, notice that they are saying something and it's not good job. Notice that it is a reminder, guys, it's going to be really hard to be a Christian. You've decided to follow Jesus Christ. He is turning the world upside down, and nobody really likes it, especially the Romans. And you're going to suffer much for the kingdom of God. Usually when I say those kind of things to people, they say, okay, Don, now be encouraging. But that's how they encouraged them. By encouraging them in teaching the truth about what their life was going to look like as Christians. And then involved in this encouragement after these early churches had begun their walk with Christ. And when they returned, it tells us something else that they did in every church. They appointed elders. So what else does this encouragement mean? Acts 11 and verse 23. So when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, 
he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. He is not telling them what they have done is good. He's not encouraging them with good job, good job. It is an encouragement to say, this is what we must do. He tells them with resolute heart, you must be true to the Lord. The idea of this word is not looking back on something praiseworthy. The idea of this word word is a projection of the present to turn eyes toward the future. Like Acts chapter 2, verse 4. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and encouraged them. Same Greek word. But it's translated, kept on urging them, be saved from this perverse generation. Peter announced to those people on the day of Pentecost, you are guilty of killing the Messiah that we have placed all of our hopes on as a nation. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. He says, you all need to be saved from this perverse generation. That was encouraging. Because this word is a very familiar word, perikaleo. To urge someone, to implore someone, and to exhort someone. It is not the, the soft tidiness of us sending beautiful Hallmark communique. It has a lot to do with forcing the eyes forward to see what needs to change in our future. And so when Paul came to the church at Philippi after leaving the jail, and he encouraged them, what was it that he did? Now, from the text, I can't tell you, because it's general. He encouraged them. In all of the texts that I've already read, there were hints about it and sometimes explicit things. Things like, you're going to suffer persecution for the kingdom of God. But what I can do is look at the way that the church at Philippi was instructed and recognize these were the expectations Paul had for them. And when this last year, when I went to Africa in Uganda, we had a seminar with preachers from many, many churches. And this was one of the lessons that I spoke. And in it, trying to make the impression to all of the men there who called themselves evangelists about what it was that Paul believed his job was in making the church at Philippi a church. When he went into Lydia's house and he stayed, what did he and Silas encourage them to do? Did he encourage them to do nothing? Just go on. You're just, you're, you're Christians now. Just go on with your life and all's good. Or did he encourage them to do something? Was repentance part of their life, a change from the things that they had once done to turning their life to do something that needed to be done? Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. He says in verse 17 to this church, This is why I have sent Timothy to you. He is my dearly loved and faithful child in the Lord, and he will remind you about my ways in Christ Jesus, just as I teach everywhere in every church. So right off the bat, the truth is, is that if Paul taught anything to any church, I can tell you that what he taught in the house of Lydia in Philippi would have been the same thing. Because he asserts, unless he's not telling the truth, that the thing that he taught in every church, he taught also through Timothy when he sent him to court. And that means that he sent the same thing to Philippi. 
So now look in Philippians chapter 3. Notice what he says in verse 17. Join in imitating me, brothers and sisters, and pay careful attention to those who live according to the example you have in us. When Paul went to the house of Lydia with Silas, and he encouraged them, I suspect he said to them what he said in every church and probably reminds them about this again in chapter 3 when he writes this letter years later, reminding them, you're supposed to be following my example. Now, it's true that the Church of Philippi gets really good press in this letter. It is not a church that's riddled with all sorts of difficulties, at least evident, by the reading of the letter. When Paul went and spoke with them, he did something. And I suggest to you the thing that he did was the thing that he did in every church. Did he teach them that everything that they had to do was random? Or did he teach them that there was some sort of pattern of thinking that Christ wanted his followers to follow. Look in the book of Romans, chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, he says in verse 17, But thank God that although you used to be slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching to which you were handed over, and having been set free from sin, you became enslaved to righteousness. When he writes to the church of Rome, he says, I I celebrate the truth that in baptism you have understand this pattern of teaching. That there was a pattern of teaching about something as simplistic as baptism. Yet, when you look at modern Christendom, you will find that in modern Christendom, everybody has a different take. Everybody has a different opinion. And when Paul and Silas went into the house of Lydia and encouraged them, did he encourage them to think about baptism in their own way? Or did he encourage them to follow baptism the way he had been taught? Was there a pattern? Look in 2 Timothy. Chapter 1, Paul says this. To this preacher... He says, hold on to the pattern of sound teaching that you heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The pattern of teaching that is the apostles' teaching is what makes us truly an apostolic church. The teaching that was revealed in the first century on the day of Pentecost, when Pentecost occurred, truly makes us, if we are really following what happened really on Pentecost, what God wants us to be as a church. There was a pattern of teaching. And there's lots of stories that I could tell about pattern, but my favorite story is this. That the greatest joy of having children is getting them to mow your lawn. And so my firstborn, Josh, meticulous in all his ways, very serious, showed him how to mow the lawn, and very dutifully, he would mow the lawn exactly like his father taught him, straight lines in the grass, just perfect chatter. And it's time to teach Daniel. Daniel, this is how you're supposed to mow the grass. I walk inside, come back out, and Daniel has gone every different direction all across the grass, and the lines are all crazy. I am a little OCD about the lines in the grass, I confess. But Daniel did not follow the pattern. 
And no, I didn't punish him. I didn't get mad at him. I just said, do better next time. But it is a fascinating reality that in our modern world, somehow we believe that because God has saved us by grace, that the patterns of the teachings, his holy uh, spirit guided apostles in their instruction no longer are binding. That the very apostles who were teaching all of these churches about the pattern of sound words and about the pattern that you have obeyed in baptism are the very people who heard from those very apostles that you have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. Even the very ones who have brought resonance to the truth of a world covered in darkness, needing the light of the gospel, knowing the true grace that is found in Jesus Christ, that apostle said, follow my teaching and the pattern of those sound words. So when Paul went into the house of Lydia with Silas and encouraged them, I suspect he told them, you need to follow the pattern of my words. What else? Was there disorder? Or did he aim them to be ordered by leadership? Now, of course, recognize that when he is looking at the audience, unless there have been new conversions, the time that he was in jail to the time that he arrives in the house of Lydia, we don't know. All we do know, it is the family of a Roman jailer, and we know it is a family of Lydia. And we don't know how many adults are in those family. We don't know, except for the ones that are named, Lydia and the jailer. It's only one man. So I'm pretty sure that he would do what anyone else would do, is that this is God's ideal for you. This is what God wants you to do. This is the thing. And we've already read the text in Acts chapter 14, verse 23. Is that he, when he returned to the churches, remember Philippi has just started. After he has taught those churches and returns to them, Acts 14, 23 says that when he and Barnabas go, that they appoint elders in every church. Ladies and gentlemen, that, that was just a couple of years and I don't doubt the possibility that there was some endowment given through perhaps through the laying on of the apostles' hands that accommodated and encouraged that. But the point was the Apostle Paul considered it absolutely urgent by appointing elders in these churches that were just beginning to keep them from floundering that they needed to understand the importance of good godly leadership. So when you read in Philippians chapter 1, listen to how Paul addresses himself to this church. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. Talking. Well within a decade or less, the church of Philippi had elders and deacons. And I suspect the reason is when Paul went into the house with Silas, who encouraged them, he was going to teach them there could not be disorder. There needed to be leadership. What else? Did he teach them that now that Jesus Christ has saved you, you are an individual in the service of the great king uh, Jesus, and you can go into the world and do everything and anything that you believe you need to do for God. Or, when he went into the house of Lydia, did he do what all the other Apollo apostles did in modeling this truth? That you belong. Notice in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 that the early church in Jerusalem devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The second thing mentioned is the word fellowship, koinonia. The basis of the word we could talk about for the rest of the evening, and I know you don't want to stay here till midnight, 
the application of the word is the idea of partnership. And I think in a practical reality, a church manifests a partnership through its financial contributions to do its work together, but it is not the totality of what that fellowship really looks like. And even in the language that we've already read, remember in Philippians chapter 4? Philippians chapter 4. Remember what he says? And you Philippians know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me. No church had fellowship with me. In the matter of giving and receiving, except only you. Paul acknowledged that the church at Philippi's fellowship was manifested by the way they partnered together to financially provide in the needs that Paul had whenever they occurred. And it happened to this church when there were just two families to provide for Paul. They may have sent 10 cents for all I know. But they believed that their role together as Christians was not simply to belong together and look at each other but to actively engage in a work that would produce good in the world. They fellowshiped together. And I think that's a terribly important thing. There was a time when someone that I know and love was very, very sick. And the church where I preached knew this person quite well. And they were just as heartbroken as I was about the sickness. And so among those individual Christians, not from the leadership, was a underground movement. Okay. We have to do something for him. And so they began circulating among the prayer group that they had among the women, and other people began to get involved and a sweet little old lady who lives on Medicare brought a check so that we could hand money over to them to provide for the medical bills that they were not prepared for. And I could not but feel in that moment, this was our fellowship. This was a manifestation of what Christians need to see our partnership in the gospel is all about. Yes, it is about partnering with the, the work of evangelism, but it is also about partnering with Christians in their most desperate needs and darkest hours. And so many times the problems that we face in our life get lost simply because we're, either we're too proud to acknowledge that or we're not loving enough. I told you that there was one thing that Church of Philippi got bad press on. Maybe you know what it is. But Philippians chapter 4, verse 2. What are the things I never did to my kids? There are a lot of preachers who do it. I don't know. Uh, Ricky did it, so I hope I'm not going to get in trouble here. But uh, I never called out my kids my name when they were misbehaving. They never misbehaved, of course. They, right, Tracy, they never misbehaved. But I don't think I ever, Joshua, Daniel, Sarah, I don't think I ever did that. And of course, here I'm on live stream and I just said their names and they're going to say, you owe me a quarter, Dad. That's a go, going joke with us. So. Yodi and Syndicate, forever immortalized that they could not get along. He says, I urge Yodia and I urge Syndicate to agree in the Lord. There is nothing more harmful to fellowship than Christians who refuse to get along. Because the truth is, when we won't get along, we won't serve each other. When we refuse to get along, we won't even try to be a blessing to each other. And all of us have lived through COVID in lots of different ways, and my wife gave me permission to use this illustration. But Tracy and I got COVID at least three times. And one time when we got it, the church was very good 
Let us bring you food. What can we do to help you? Da, 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 da. Text back. We're okay. It's all right. Thank you. Okay. Five days in a row, constantly replying back. I don't really remember saying this, but I told. she says I told her, can you just let me tell these people to serve us and bring us food? He said, yes. Because how can we accept a blessing when we want other people to accept blessings from us? The thing that teaches us that is fellowship. That we are equal partners in this gospel. And when Paul and Silas walked into the house of Lydia, a woman who Jewish circles probably would have thought worshiping with a, a pagan jailkeeper would be unclean. He said, you're going to have to figure out how to get along and be the people of God and serve him. Which leads us to this last truth. Did he allow them the option to be discordant? That's my favorite word this year, discordant. I love music and discordant chords do not sound good to my ear. And I think discordant Christians are an offense to God. What did he teach them to do? Well, we know what he taught the church at Ephesus. Look in Ephesians chapter 4. Look in verse 1. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, Bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. That is, as we often call it, the platform of unity. But it isn't a platform you and I have created. It is the divine arrangement of the things that we are committed to keeping as the unity of us as believers. And notice he prefaces everything about that, about your heart and your mouth. I urge you to live worthy of the calling with humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep that unity through the bond of peace. It's not my brother's fault there's disunity if I'm the one at odds with him. When he walked into that house teaching those two families what they have now become, he says, it's your job now to keep the unity of what the Spirit will be. And ladies and gentlemen, nothing has changed. That's what we're supposed to be doing. The something that the apostles have taught us. In a pattern of sound words that are revealed in the New Testament, by shaping men and women, in understanding their important roles in all of the things that the church needs to accomplish, but especially in developing men to be elders. So that we would understand with true reality what it means to be partners in the gospel. The strength of a church relies not upon merely strong leadership, but upon people who truly understand that they are part of a partnership in a grand and glorious doing that is not their own. But the grand and glorious doing of what Jesus Christ has accomplished to give to the world. And we're to do it with unity. I believe that's what Paul would have told them. 
I don't know if it took five minutes. I don't know if it took five hours. I don't know if he stayed 35 days. I don't know. But I don't doubt the Apostle Paul didn't lie. I believe the Apostle Paul was true when he said, I'm going to send Timothy to you because he's going to teach you the same thing I teach in every church. And these are the things that he taught them because these are the things he taught everywhere. And these are the things he has taught you. So please hear my exhortation. Being a follower of Jesus Christ is a blessing. It is a joy and a grace that gives you hope, but it is a responsibility to join yourself to Christians and belong in a church, a fellowship, to partner with the work that God has given Christians to do together. Yes, there is much more work that you need to do as an individual Cowley out all of the commands in the New Testament and you will find the larger portion of being a bright light in our world and a salt to the earth is going to come around in the way that Don Hooten behaves every day and you too. But that does not exclude the responsibility God has placed upon Don Hooten to join myself to Christ's disciples and belong to them and understand and when Paul went into that young beginning church, he needed to show them the way. This is the way. Because this is the way Paul taught in every church. Please be encouraged to do that. Because guess what Paul did when he went into that house? He encouraged them. He gave them the courage to see that all of the things that you see ahead of you are well within your capability. It is all well within the accessibility of what your faith will make powerful in your life if you will just listen and if you will just learn from the greatest teacher of all, the Savior who died for you. The Savior who who recognized that the one thing that God had brought him to do, to die for sinful humanity, was a something that had to be accomplished. And that through the prophecies that God had spoken years and years long before, patterned for his life everything that was going to happen, and that's exactly how Jesus lived his life, to follow in the way that God instructed it would be. Because he was going to be the good shepherd, he was going to be the head of this body of believers. He was going to be the king of a great kingdom that would never be destroyed. So he would understand the importance of leadership. And so he chose 12 to nurture in them a leadership that would carry on to the rest of his ministry. So that they would experience a fellowship with him in the work that God had given him and truly understand unity. Not different. The same thing. And you and I need to see that as God's people today, the task is never greater. The task is never less. The task is the same. Because God died to save the world. And he brought you to this place so that the world could hear that message. So focus upon the something, the pattern, the leadership, the fellowship, and the unity. That Paul walked into a room with two young families who encouraged them. I encourage you. And tonight, if you need to become a Christian, let this song encourage you to come and let us know of your need. And if you're not, if you are a Christian and you need assistance and you need help, I know the elders would be glad to pray with you. But if you're a Christian who knows the way of God and you felt 
a little prick tonight and a little urge, a little nudge. Go with courage to do what you know God can do through you. Thank you for connecting with us this morning. We're so thankful that you were able to do that. If you have questions, we'd love to have the opportunity to talk to you. You can contact us at www.thebibleway.com or questions at thebibleway.com. Questions at thebibleway.com. We'd love to have you in person. Come if you can, but thank you for connecting with us.